Welcome back, everybody, to episode number 95 of the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. Welcome back, and here we go. Reminder now, uh, if you want all the videos and everything, be sure to sign up at DanJohnUniversity.com. It's very inexpensive, and it also gives you a huge discount to our courses there. Now, we already have courses on goal setting and a new one on programming, and right now we're actively working on a new one, uh, which I'll kind of save for another time. Uh, if that's not something you want, we also have a site at Patreon, Coach Dan John. Thank you, and let's get started. First question here is from Phil. Uh, good question. Uh, and it's part of the reason that I teach uh, the goblet squat and then the overhead squat next. And, and if you've watched my videos on that, you'll see how I combine those two. I have a question, Phil says, about range of motion in squats which has been driving me a little crazy. Uh, not just a little crazy. When I goblet squat, I can fairly easily get my thighs below parallel with my heels kept on the floor. Yeah, and that's part of the reason the goblet squat works so well, because you have the load out in front. Uh, if I gave you a sand, big old sandbag, 100 pounds, uh, uh, 45 kilos, and you and I had you bear hug it, your squat would probably be pretty good also. Uh, having that load countering is one of the secrets that I tell everybody about the goblet squat, but let's go on. Um, but as soon as I get a bar across my shoulders, my range of motion tightens right up so I can barely get my thighs to parallel. So I don't have a video of you, Phil, but there's there's two quick things. Remember, when you, have, when you do front squats, back squats, uh, zerchers are pretty natural. And then, of course, there's overhead squats. Um, the load, uh, is no longer in this nice, convenient, uh, baby carry position. You know, I got a newborn up there and little Leo, he's, he's easy to squat with. Um, when you're squat, so that's number one. Number two, and this one's probably just important, you don't squat on your legs, you squat between your legs. And that's why the elbow pushing out the knees in the goblet squat seems to cure most people's problems. It's going to sound weird, but if I get there and, well, you kind of have to do it yourself, but if we can somehow get you to push your elbows out while back squatting, you probably drop down nicely because instead of squatting on your legs, you're squatting between your legs. It is so important that you, 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 and there's my dog. Um, I, I, Phil, I have to say this right now. My dog does not like your question. He's very angry about your squat issues. Um, and I can barely get my thighs to parallel. Well, I, I think that's part of the reason, my friend, okay? <laughs> and Mr. Sirius Black does not approve. Uh, from a biomechanical point of view, I don't understand how changing the position of my arm shoulders alters the range of motion of my hips. Can you explain this? I, I tried to, but the reason I want to put off this last point, and that's why I teach the goblet squat, and then at the bottom, you curl the way to the ground and you pick up a broomstick and you widen out your hands while you're still in the bottom. And then you stand up in the overhead squat. Soon you move to the 20 kilo bar or you have people put the load on top of you, which is actually very good if you have good spotters. Because most people can't overhead squat, not because of the shoulder flexibility nonsense you see. It's because their, their hips are in the raw their orientation of their body to their hips, knees, and ankles in the wrong place. You squat between your legs, not on your legs. Okay, Phil, hope that helps. Got a question here from John, and it's a good question. Um, one thing, I've been getting a lot of questions about 12 and 13 and 14-year-old children from parents. I'm never comfortable with that, but let's. there's some things in this question that I, I think is okay. My 13-year-old has been dancing for many years, loves it, is both athlete and artist. Unfortunately, the onset of puberty has left her with a fairly sudden change in body composition. Medical issues have been ruled out. Our dancer would like to get down to about 15% body fat from her current 28 to 30%. Injury prevention, performance, and aesthetic issues are all important. We, mom, dad, and dancer all in together, are starting a lot of, lots of, you know, basic stuff, lots of vegetables, Palm-sized portion of protein, nuts, and seeds, some fruit, a little starch, and no sugar diet. Yeah, stuff probably should have been eaten since could have had a solid food. 
She has had some basic kettlebell instruction and is comfortable with a two-handed swing with a light bell and is interested in working with kettlebells to get in shape. We have a garage gym with a good assortment of kettlebells, power rack, barbell, and bumper plates, jump rope, med balls, and places to bike, run, and swim, readily accessible. Our dancer is motivated, has a good attitude, and we want to keep it that way. Fall editions, August 29th, are in the current target, so we have about three months to get her into shape. Oh, my God, she's 13. What are your thoughts on training protocols that would promote strength, not mass, and improvement in body composition? I write about this all the time, John. Um, uh, basically, as, as you may or may not know, if you go to the site, there's something called Easy Strength for Fat Loss. It's combining some very, very simple uh, movements. Uh, in your daughter's case, I wouldn't mind seeing an overhead press. A uh, hang probably fine. A deadlift would be fine. Uh, ab wheel, and then she goes out for a walk, bike ride, or whatever. Um, I'm not comfortable telling a 13-year-old girl in puberty to drop body fat because of the long-term um, issues with her reproductive health, her her bone density, and, and the usual. But uh, that's the best advice I can give. Um, and, uh, I mean, be a master of the craft and uh, don't fall into this nonsense that uh, she has to look a certain way to be great. Great dancers come in all shapes and sizes, I think. And maybe you can disagree with me, but uh, um, if, if, if they don't want her, find somebody who does, because the world needs more dancers and singers and artists. We have a question from Tim. Tim says, I don't own a squat rack, and in my quest for an alternative to back squats, recently happened upon the barbell hack squat. He says, similar to deadlift, uh, but the bar is held behind one's back. I've been doing them for a few weeks and absolutely loved them. I don't know if I have the right body proportions or something, but after a few sets, I feel like a mighty warrior. I am curious, though, as to why barbell hack squats are so rarely practiced or even discussed. Uh, they kind of come and go um, in the 60s with sissy squats from Vince Garanda and Larry Scott. They made a comeback uh, in the early kettlebell world. Um, I can't remember if it was Steve Maxwell or Steve Cotter kind of brought them roaring back for a few years. Uh, the issue is, Tim, a lot of us aren't born to do it, and it just makes our knees freak out. Uh, you know, I had a friend uh, go to a, Tom Platts, the great bodybuilder, went to Tom Platts's uh, workshop. And Tom just said that was, you know, the, that and back squats, the answer to all questions. But once he started watching Tom do hack squats on the machine, he realized that Tom is just built different and um, doesn't carve his knees up like it carves up some of ours. Yeah, I know it's become a new thing again to discount this whole idea about uh, where your knees should be in relationship to your feet. And again, I mean, we all, we always go too far in this field anyway, but um yeah, if if a, if an exercise and you're doing it correctly hurts your knees, then don't do them. Um, and in your case, Tim, uh, you, you like them. And I got to tell you, you're kind of in rare air. Most of the people I know, uh, I mean, uh, hack squats just uh, just rip the knees. I think that's why. Um, it is a outstanding uh, deadlift variation uh, if you ever just want to play around with it. But you'll find most people like myself, I can't grab the bar from the floor behind my behind my body. I can't. I mean, I can't. I mean, I can, but I have to make a lot of adaptions that I don't necessarily like, and and then it rubs against my Achilles tendon and that hurts. I don't like that. So uh, I'm not the toughest guy in the world. Um, gosh, Tim, I hope that helps. Um, Hack and Schmidt explained to us that the hack is not named after him. Uh, it it's a German word for something else, um, but uh, because he was known as Hack, we all blame poor Mr. Hackam Schmidt for coming up with it. I don't know if I helped you at all, but you know, hey, if it feels good and you have no issues, do it. I, I know a lot of people do like the Jefferson lift and really enjoy it, and the person next to him says, boy, that just twists me up, or whatever. Thanks, Tim. Good question. 
We have a question from Daniel. Now, this is interesting. We've had a Daniel, a Phil, a John, my whole family today. Uh, <clears throat> Daniel says, I've heard you say on your podcast that you should never fail a body weight rep. Example, a pull-up. Can you elaborate on that? Why is that so? I, I don't remember saying that, but, uh, you know, especially, you know, I'm so deep into easy strength now that missing a rep in training is 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 against all of our laws and commandments and rules. Um, yeah, going to failure on a, on a pull-up, going to failure on a lot of things physically, I, I would say especially on a pull-up. When, when you fail on pull-ups, you tend to fail in this range right here, you know, and what happens is the the elbow here, um, we call it MAPS, Middle Age Pull-Up Syndrome, really starts to show up. And once you get it, you don't get rid of it. I don't know. So that's why I don't like to fail on them. Uh, I prefer hangs, hanging pull-ups. You hang for 30 seconds and you do them. Um, uh, and then the second question is, is is not really in my lane, but I'll do what I can to help. How would you go about learning the feet towards the wall handstand push-up? Well, the way I taught handstands, uh, a big part of how we, we call them wall walks, where you, you put your feet against the wall in the push-up position, and then you slowly march your feet up. And as you march your feet up, you kind of reverse bear crawl yourself until you're standing. Well, it takes a while to get this, but most kids will get the 45 on day one, and then they'll slide, then they'll slide, then they'll slide. And most kids really can't get any farther because uh, the body then starts to shift away. Then we would just do um, uh, kind of a little uh, hands up, stands up thing and let their feet hit the wall at the top. Uh, the heels hit the wall at the top and just load on to it. And then a really good exercise, we used to call it uh, handstand marching in place, where I'm, st I'm standing marching in place with my hands, with my feet against the wall. And within a few days, most, most of the athletes could do a handstand. I mean, you know, not for an hour or something, you know. But uh, most of the kids could do a handstand, hold it for three or five seconds, you know, three, four or five seconds, which is just fine. Um, some athletes will show up to your gym and they'll say that's a handstand and jump on the ground and walk around the building three times because you know it's like i've had athletes do pistols the first time they ever saw it with load the first time uh, some people are just built that, uh, different i hope that helps we have a question from christian i've lost 100 pounds over the past year and i've been keeping the weight off within about five pounds for the last five months well that's good and i want to see you keep it down on a uh and that's really more important to me than losing the weight in the first place is staying where you're at. During my weight loss, though a combination of enthusiasm and stupidity, I managed to get quite bad tendonitis in both forearms, a combination of too much rowing and trying to increase my pull-up numbers. Back to middle age pull-up syndrome. Golfer's elbow, not talent tennis elbow. Yeah. Given that I cannot, at least in the short term, do a lot of pull movements without re-injuring my forearms, do you have any suggestions for workouts that would help protect them while I rehab them? I try to walk about 15,000 steps a day and do kettlebells much lighter now while I'm rehabbing three days a week, but I'm worried that I'm not getting a lot of pulling and my physio is telling me that full recovery from golfer's elbow could easily be six months or longer. Any thoughts you have will be most welcome. Yeah, I think your physio is right. And here's the thing, um, Christian, is that uh, elbow injuries seem to, well, they're, they're tough, but once you hurt them, they seem to take a while to, to come around. You know, my thought is this, and maybe this is a little different than what I would normally recommend, but, you know, you, you've already done a lot of good stuff. I'm going to tell you to do two things. First, let's not worry about pull-ups and pulls. Just forget about them. I mean, if you're doing kettlebell work, uh, if you're doing swings, there's a massive amount of, uh, it's not really, it's pull stability. It's, you know, everything's locked and loaded in there, which can be really valuable for the pulling muscles. It's not like your pulling muscles are all just going to fall asleep in six months and, you know, wither away and die. You know, you'll take care of business. Um, but if you're doing swings, um, if you can do Turkish get-ups, uh, 
I mean, gobble squat should be fine. I'm thinking if you can clean and press. Boy, just, j just do that. And remember, when you clean and press, and before I move on to my next point, clean, every time you bring the weight down, pull it down with some tension and pride, okay? The other thing, can you just hang? Um, hanging is... I just, and by the way, people always ask this idiotic question if I teach active hanging. I got no idea what that means, but what I want you to do is I want you to hang, okay? I want you to hang, all right? And just hang, and that will get your grip strength, and it will, it's like you, the word glute activation happens sometimes. I think we're going to get some lat activation going on. You're going to get, you're going to really have to, because of the time under tension you're gonna have to wake up everything up there so i think that might help so just train with kettlebells and do some hangs uh, oddly it's about what i tell 95 percent of the people i talk to so there you go and congrats on your weight loss that's really good eli uh is it asks a question recently both my brother and my wife have expressed interest in training with me you're a brave soul, Eli. My brother is a 15-year-old. Okay, that's different. Cross-country runner and is all knees and elbows. Oh, that's fantastic. I would eventually like to get him on a mass building program as I think uh, looking better would give him a much-needed confidence boost. My wife is 23. There's a bunch of children here. Has almost no experience with organized athletics and has had arthritis problems her whole life. I'm sorry. She's interested in improving her general fitness and losing fat. She is also extremely difficult to coach. You're going to coach your, old, your own wife, and she's difficult to coach. You know, Eli, I, 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 think, I think we need to go to some kind of meeting together. You know, hi, I'm Dan. And, you know, um, because she never played sports, she's not be at all used to being pushed at all. Not that I'm screaming and yelling at her or anything crazy. What programs would you recommend for each of them and do you have any tips on coaching? Yeah, I have a ton of tips on coaching. Come on, man. But uh, Eli, here's, here. I mean, this is the easiest thing you can do, and, and it's win-win for you. Uh, join Dan John University, plug in your wife's stuff, and, uh, you know, you can have additional members. I, um, when you get in there, you'll see a little area called coaching, and you could come up with a program for both your brother, the 15-year-old, and your wife, but here's the nice thing. You didn't write it. I kind of sort of did with, you know, artificial intelligence uh, helping us and, of course, Brian helping us. So, you know, if you use the workout generator and she wants to work out two days a week, she's going to have two days a week with nice full whole body workouts. If she says, I want to work out five days a week, five days a week of nice full whole body workouts. For your brother in cross country, I think... Um, I mean, I think it will really help him. I mean, don't forget, much of my knowledge about, this is going to sound weird, but coaching track and field for straight comes from a famous distance runner, distance coach down in Australia, Percy Cerruti, uh, Cerruti, uh, Percy Cerruti. And uh, so, yeah, I think, I think, just get them both on the workout generator. Uh, if you have questions on how to uh, log in the other two people, uh, let us know on the forum. And it's pretty simple. It's called coaching. You add in their, their names. And the upside is, I understand it, uh, they'll get a little ping and they'll have the workouts on their own phone or whatever they have. Um, as for coaching, embrace the obvious, number one. Runners run. Uh, number two, with your wife, uh, since she's never done really anything, she's going to make the best progress of anybody you ever worked with. Um, it doesn't have to be crazy. It can be go for a walk two days a week. It can be something as simple as you show her two lifts and she does two lifts. She could probably do a, a deadlift variation and a press variation for six weeks. Go for a couple of walks every week and make the best progress of any client any of us will ever have. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so, embrace the obvious. Um, her nutrition. Um, her sleep. You know, you can help with that, you know. Um, some simple one, two, three simple exercises and uh, walking. And all of her dreams will come true. Uh, 
I hope that helps. Thank you. We have a very short question from Tom. How would you go? How would you go back training for a military obstacle course? Well, the best thing I know, Tom, um, <laughs> is, is doing obstacle courses. Uh, any kind of uh, monkey bar work you do, brachiating and stuff. Um, uh, go find a public park, find a par course, P-A-R course. Uh, here in Utah, I know of a couple. Uh, Skyline College had a great one. Uh, you could probably invent your own in a schoolyard. Um, monkey bars are great. Uh, practicing going over things uh, is great. You know, any kind of uh, parkour is great. Um, one thing I really suggest you do, and this is my test for my military uh, athletes, uh, for my the people I work with in the military, is I expect them to be able to do four pull-ups, but the pull-ups are like this. Hang for 30 seconds, do a pull-up. While you're still up there, hang for another 30 seconds, do a pull-up. Hang for another 30 seconds, do a pull-up. And then finally, hang for that last nightmare and do that last pull-up. Uh, it is a long time hanging, but that's the kind of strength the in, in upper body endurance you'll need for obstacle course training. And then, of course, any work you can get on jumping over stuff, crawling under, however you do it, is going to be helpful. Um, I really like uh, Tim Anderson's original strength here, where the emphasis on crawling and rucking, uh, much of the stuff you already do. Uh, when I when I visit uh, bases, I'm always amazed at how many of the people still just jog and it's like oh, how does jogging tie into this kind of thing it doesn't at all so those are some general ideas tom and if you have more specifics you email me and we can talk on the phone or something okay we have a question from ab Hully, Abley. my goal for this year is to press the 28k bell for five reps with each arm i can push press the 28 for one that's a good start but feel my form waver post that how should I proceed? Well, uh, I actually like the idea of you sticking with the push press. Uh, the, here's the thing, man. Uh, if you want to be a good presser, you got to press. I mean, that's just that's given. But we can work around it too. One idea I'd like you to think about is either a two-handed press or push press. Go for a waiter walk, so a loaded 28 kilo waiter walk, and get. Get some time being strong in that lockout position. I would also suggest doing some walks with the, um, uh, the in the rack position too, right down there and deep. I'd like to know what your form uh, looks like, but uh, so waiter walk, rack walk, okay, those two things. Um, I like the idea of you push pressing a weight and bringing it down as slow as you can. Push press slow as you can. Trying to keep everything in that nice groove. I just did a video on kettlebell pressing. I hope that helps. It's on it's on the site here. It's on the forum. So um, uh, it's on the YouTube channel too. Um, so you should be able to find that without a problem. Uh, I like I'd like to see you press about five days a week and have huge variations in volume. Um, I love you know one day you go in and you do you know a very light load and you just get some practice doing it. Uh, you need to train your nervous system. I would say you're probably going to need at least one heavy workout a week, one high rep workout a week, and then maybe three days a week, you know, play in that 15 to 25 range, three sets of eight, five sets of five, just practicing pressing. That should get you on the right track. Uh, and of course, just check in when uh, uh, you need help, okay? Well, thank you. That's episode number 95 of the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. Remember, if you have questions, I don't mind answering them. Sometimes I struggle with some of them, and I'll be honest, I always am. Uh, but if you have questions, email me at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. As we're sneaking up on 2,000 videos now, there's a good chance I've answered it already. But if it's a good question, I'll always come back and answer it again. Thank you, and we'll talk soon.